of knowledge except reports about it. And the building had not been, uh, had not continued to exist. There isn't a soul on earth who would believe that it had ever been built. And this is more or less the situation. The only reason we have to accept it is because it's there. And the more we study it, the less we know about it. Now, the uh, modern researchers have found in the uh, pressure ch uh, spaces above the king's chamber some markings which are assumed to be part of the, of the inscription of the burial Cheops that the this cartouche of Cheops but when you see the cartouche photographed it's hard to get to look at the actual one the condition is so dim and so faint that there may be very grave doubt as to whether Cheops had anything to do with it at all in the first place a proud ferio wishing to mark a building as a proof of his own skills would not have placed those inscriptions in a position where they could never be read, never could be seen, and in the process of completing the building were most of them mutilated or completely obliterated. Therefore, it is not at all likely that the proud Ferio uh, put something in those chambers that could not be found for, for thousands of years, and then only by accident. Most of the Egyptian monuments are clearly marked with the cartouches of their originators. Some of them also have taken off an earlier cartouche and put their own in its place, the cartouche being an oval lozenger containing the name of the perio. So the Cheops theory is pretty weak, although it is still clung to for lack of a better one. And I think the real thing we have to go into in studying this is to find out, if we can, what the actual meaning of the building is. Why it was put where it is. Why other buildings and the Sphinx are in the same and person, uh, particular relationship to each other. Some of the more thoughtful progressives have come to the possible conclusion that the Great Pyramid was part of a great calendar system that by means of it, it was possible to calculate most of the important phenomena of astronomy. The uh, ancients did not have t uh, telescopes as we know them, but they did have uh, ways of calculating mathematically uh, the various positions of planets and the precession of the equinoxes. And it's been suggested that the Great Pyramid and its immediate surrounding structures was a, tr a tremendous calendar structure, perhaps the oldest known to man. This is not unreasonable if we think about it. We know that one of the pyramids in, in Yucatan, in Chichen Itza, was an observatory, the parts of which still remain and record no, we know that it was an observatory. There are also other indications. The great Zugarats of Babylonia and Chaldea were towers for stargazing. They were where the ancient Chaldeans studied the heavens year after year, century after century. And according to Budge of the British Museum, many of these uh, studies and calculations were carried on for 10 or 20,000 years. One thing that comes to mind then in connection with this whole situation is that we may have to revise our understanding of what antiquity was like. Perhaps we uh, cannot assume that we have gradually arisen from a completely barbarian state and that in a few thousand years behind our present culture there was nothing but a colossal ignorance. This concept will not hold. Somewhere along the way there were tremendous minds, a great body of knowledge that was capable of planning and executing unbelievable works of skill, beauty, and wisdom. The uh, Egyptians themselves were of the opinion that at a remote time the gods had been with men that deities and divine powers walked the earth. 
Now, uh, this again may be regarded as symbolical. Perhaps what they were trying to tell us is that in a remote time long ago, the human being was naturally mystical, naturally had the power of extrasensory perception, naturally could communicate or understand, estimate, or react to the divine principles upon which the universe was based. That the really the, the gods walking with men merely meant that the god power in man was not obscured as it is now. That gradually over a course of time uh, the material world has taken over. The ancient peoples had a very simple physical existence comparatively. There was no problem of population, no intensive competition in trade, and wars were comparatively uh, limited to a few swashbuckling militarists. The people in general lived a very quiet and a natural life, completely dependent upon their insights into universal laws. Just as the American Indian, without any assistance from the outside, not only developed a profound mysticism, but evolved from within himself practically every law, rule, and principle necessary to the government of his affairs. The uh, Great League of the Iroquois was probably one of the most important move movements of international peace that the world ever knew. And yet it was developed and perfected by Indians sitting under trees, wrapped in skins of animals and with feathers in their hair. And yet these people, intuitively and internally, had a tremendous depth of insight. This depth of insight has been lost as the result of the individual being subjected to continual external conditioning. He is taught from childhood not to think for himself, not to search within himself for the answers to his problems, but to read them out of books and have them conferred upon him by physical educational processes. As a result of that, he has lost the power of direct contact with realities. His new philosophy, if you can call it such, is built entirely upon the opinions of his contemporaries and the t interpretations by these contemporaries of earlier documents and beliefs. If we assume that the individual was a source of almost complete knowledge, that he had the skills and the abilities to intuit nearly everything necessary to his own survival, it is then quite probable that we are gradually going to learn that the leaders of this intuitive procedure were parts of a great sacerdotal group. You might be willing to call them the mysterious sages, uh, the, wor the wise men of ancient times, the, er the first ones of the earth who knew, and the giants of mind and thought who were upon the earth in those days. In any event, however, there was undoubtedly a tradition that descended into Egypt from a still earlier source, a tradition based upon an internal development of spiritual resources, a development which went back perhaps to India or to one of the ancient civilizations that have now vanished away. But at the, by four or 5,000 or even 10,000 B.C., uh, there was a great knowledge in the hands or in the keeping of a few persons. And these few persons more or less set up the system of mysteries which operated in Egypt, Greece, and the Roman Empire. Now in this also, I think it is very important uh, to bear in mind that the initiate system, which was the prevailing system in Egypt at that time, uh, was based upon one tremendous point, a point which we have lost, a point which we have never really attempted to restore, but about which we have given considerable thought and consideration. The purposes of the mysteries, according to such initiates as Plotinus, Procris, Iamblichus, Ammonius, Saccus, and others, was it's very simple, that the individual should learn factually, truly, beyond question, beyond doubt, 
through personal experience that death is an illusion.